Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Jetalo, and today I'm going to be talking about Fedora Core OS build tooling, so how we actually build the Fedora Core OS artifacts. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I used to work for Core OS uh, in San Francisco, and when I was there, I worked mostly on container Linux and Ignition. Uh, as you know, about a year ago, uh, Red Hat acquired Core OS, and so now I work for Red Hat, and I now work on Fedora Core OS, Ignition, and still container Linux. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit of the background in terms of how we've built Fedora Atomic Host and Container Linux, since those are the two projects that came together to make Fedora Core OS. I'm going to talk about what goals we set out uh, when we were talking about what we wanted out of our build system for Fedora Core OS, and then where we are now for actually implementing that and what we want to do next. Uh, so. Container Linux is uh, Gen2 based. It's actually a fork of Google Chromium OS. And this means that we compile everything from source ourselves. Uh, there's no bin packages, uh, binary packages like RPMs we can use. And we have an SDK, which has all of the tools we need to build uh, Container Linux in it. And this is basically just a tarball that you download and true it into. You've got a little bit of tooling around that to make it much easier. Uh, but when you download that tarball, it has everything you need uh, there aren't very many dependencies on the host, so as long as you're running a reasonably recent kernel, you can download this on any distro and build container Linux. Uh, this is also self-hosting, so every time we do a release, uh, we also build a new SDK that'll be used to build the next release. Uh, and this means uh, that we end up building our tools to build our tools to build our tools to build our tools, and it's even more than that because uh, we go through a full Gen2 bootstrap process every time we build the SDK. So we, we end up starting with a small subset of tools uh, and that uh, we then use to build themselves to verify that uh, they actually can build themselves and we are in fact self-hosting and then build the actual OS from that. Uh, this has a lot of advantages. Uh, Gen2 is really flexible. Uh, they have something called use flags and if you're not familiar with them, uh, they're a way of abstracting away compile time uh, options. So a lot of packages might have like optional X11 support. And with Gen2, there's one common flag for saying, I, I want or I don't want X11 support. So for building a really minimal OS like Container Linux, we can globally say we don't want any X11 support on any of our packages. We don't want any Python or anything like that. Uh, Gen2's packages are also very close to upstream. Uh, they try not to patch except for when they really need to to get something to work. Uh, so we avoided a lot of like distroisms with Container Linux. Um, and this SDK uh, that we have means that we're not tied to any one distro for building it. Uh, so like when I was working at CoreOS, we had people running Gen2, people running Fedora, people running Nixos. Uh, our releases themselves uh, also use the SDK, and so that was happening on Container Linux itself. And this means that our release pipeline that we had is identical to the like, developer build process. You know when you're building it on your laptop, it's not going to be different than when it actually goes out to be built for a release. And finally, uh, Gentoo makes it really easy to hack on like, software on your own system. They have a method for just adding patches that you have locally when you go to build your software. And then the SDK took it a step further, and this is something we inherited from Google Chrome OS, where uh, you can tell it, hey, instead of going out to the internet and downloading a tarball of my source or getting it from Git, uh, I have it in this directory here, build that instead. So if I'm working on a project like Ignition, I can have the source cloned locally and then build from that directly and build the packages that way. This also has uh, some disadvantages. If you're going to be building everything from source every release, it's really slow. Uh, and we also don't have uh, an army of packagers to help us. Like Gentoo Upstream is pretty good, uh, but there's a lot of combinations of packages and use flags and other configuration, uh, which makes it much harder for them to catch all the bugs. Uh, and so a lot of times you ended up having to fix like uh, build failures ourselves. This means there's a lot of maintenance for keeping Container Linux running. Uh, and it's made worse by the fact that we manually pull in packages one by one rather than taking the entire Gen2 tree at once. And so when we have to update one package, we may end up actually needing to update that one package and 20 of its dependencies all at once. 
Um, we also cross-compiled instead of building everything uh, natively. Uh, and we ran into is a lot of issues where packages would build differently when they're cross-compiling than when they're building uh, natively, and we introduced uh, bugs like that. So this is just to give you an idea of what I mean by when we say we have slow builds. Uh, these are pretty fast by container Linux standards. Uh, this is after we've dropped ARM support, so we don't need to build like the ARM backends for GCC and LLVM and all those tools. Uh, this is doing like a single build, uh, not a whole bunch concurrently. So, yeah. Uh, the Fedora Atomic host side uh, is a lot more similar to what people who are familiar with Fedora would expect. It's built from Fedora RPMs. It's built on the Fedora infrastructure. The RPMs come from Koji, like they do the same RPMs that Fedora uses. You get your images and your installers from Punji, and that under the hood is using Anaconda to like, build the cloud images by basically installing it to a virtual disk. Uh, this has also some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, first of all, there's already infrastructure for this that's great, and people maintain it. Uh, and you don't need to rebuild all of your packages every release. You already have like binary RPMs you can consume. On the other hand, it makes it a lot harder to know that like what you're testing locally on your uh, own like developer machine is exactly what's going to get released. Uh, and because it doesn't have something where you can just build an RPM locally from a directory uh, and pull that into your uh, build process, it makes testing a small change in a uh, project that you're working on uh, a lot harder when you're testing it integrated into the rest of the OS. So when we set out to see like what do we want out of the build process for Fedora Core OS, we kind of wanted the best of both worlds to you know the largest degree possible. Uh, we really wanted to preserve the distro independence uh, because people running containers uh, are the target for <coughs> Fedora Core OS. Part of the whole idea of containers is it doesn't matter like what operating system you're on. And so we didn't want to have people uh, developing Fedora Core OS need to be running Fedora. Uh, we also wanted to preserve that idea that your release process is just your developer process <coughs> happening like in an official release pipeline on some Jenkins somewhere. Uh, and we didn't want to duplicate all of the hard work that goes into packaging things for Fedora. And similarly, we didn't want to have to rebuild everything all the time. Uh, and we wanted to preserve the idea that like, we sh it should be easy to hack on projects in Fedora Core OS. Uh, as someone who works on Ignition, uh, that's very tightly coupled to the OS uh, it runs on. And so frequent you have to frequently test it integrated with the whole OS. And so uh, we wanted to make it really easy to hack on projects within Fedora Core OS. And we wanted to do a much better job of supporting multiple architectures. This is something that Container Linux never really did well. I think at the most ARM users we ever have is four. Uh, so at this point, uh, it's probably a good idea to talk about what we're actually building. And this will be a little bit of review if you were in the overview talk before this. Uh, but Fedora Core OS is uh, the release artifact is an image that is directly bootable, like you can DD it to a disk and boot that. Uh, we have one standard partition layout, uh, and you can actually change that with Ignition, but that happens on first boot rather than at install time. Uh, this means that our installer is basically just DD, and if you're installing a bare metal, uh, injecting an Ignition config. Uh, but other than that, that's it. Um, this is very similar to Container Linux, and there we have the uh, CoreOS install script that's just a, like, 200 line bash script and about 80% of it is a GPG key. Uh, so, and then we also want to have just one release image. And this means one image that supports BIOS and UEFI. Uh, turns out you can do them together. Uh, Container Linux has done this for years. Uh, and we also want to have just one image for all the different platforms. So like one image that works with GCE and uh, AWS and on bare metal. And you can't quite do that. You have to have a little bit in there that's different to just tell, hey, I'm, I'm on this platform. Uh, you know, Ignition should go fetch its config from uh, AWS's metadata or GCE's. But other than that, we want it to be the same. So right now we have the CoreOS assembler project. Uh, 
And this is just like a game. Uh, you can run it with Docker or Podman. Uh, and all it does is compose it a uh, OS tree from RPMs using RPM OS tree. Uh, and then builds disk images out of that uh, with Anaconda. And we actually want to move away from using Anaconda for that, but I'll get into that more later. So this is a uh, rough diagram of what the build process looks like. Uh, we have a config that has uh, your tree file for RPM OS tree, which defines like what packages you want. Uh, you have kickstart file for Anaconda, and again, looking to remove that, but more on that later. And there's some uh, configs for extra yum repos and other miscellaneous bits. Uh, and then we also pull in all the Fedora RPMs that we need. And this all gets pulled in by a container uh, which is uh, built from the CoreOS assembly repo, and that's mostly just a Docker file and a bunch of scripts. Uh, and then out of it, we get disk images and an OS tree repo with a commit for the release we made. And these build scripts are pretty simple. Like all the, there's two main uh, scripts you need to run to build an image. It's just init, which clones in the config you specified and downloads Anaconda. And then when you go to build, it uses RPM OS tree to compose an OS tree from the RPMs. Uh, and then you create a disk image with Anaconda. And there you have the little bit that goes in and injects the correct uh, platform ID for whatever platform you're building for. And that, that's about it. Uh, but we also wanted to make it easy to work on the build process itself. Uh, so with that, we have uh, a little script called bottle cap. Uh, and it's called bottle cap because the old SDK for container Linux is called cork. Uh, and so if you have your uh, CoreOS assembly repo cloned locally and you've got some changes to the build scripts there, you can run the bottle cap script with the developer mode option and that will bind in your uh, scripts to the container and then uh, install them into the container. So we we're looking forward where you know we might not necessarily have them all be scripts. They might be compiled in the future. So it'll actually build them, reinstall them, uh, and then go about the build process uh, as it would normally. And this has been really useful. I've been working on trying to remove Anaconda recently and being able to quickly iterate on this rather than having to rebuild a Docker container every time. It's been really useful. Uh, the other thing we wanted to avoid is needing to use privileged containers. And if you're building a uh, operating system, this is somewhat harder. Uh, RPM OS tree uh, uses bubble wrap uh, for some isolation internally, uh, but you need to be running that in a privileged container because it can't create namespaces otherwise. Uh, as I've been trying to remove Anaconda, my first thought was to do what Container Linux does and use loop devices uh, for uh, virtual hard drives. Uh, but they aren't namespaced, and you need to bind them out in the devfs for that. Um, and I also ran into an issue where on my local laptop, I don't have SE Linux enabled in my kernel. And if uh, you do that, then uh, the image you build will not have the labels, uh, SE Linux labels apply properly. And so when I finally got that working enough to boot it, everything failed because uh, nothing was labeled properly. So to get around this, uh, there's a cool project called Superman. And what Superman does is allows you to really quickly build a VM out of RPMs on your host, which in this case is the container. Uh, and then we can then boot that VM using Hemu uh, with uh, dev KVM mounted into the container. Uh, and RPM OS tree can use its bubble wrap. We don't need loop devices anymore because we can just attach a disk uh, to the uh, VM. And uh, because we're using the Fedora kernel, we've got SE Linux there, and all of those problems are solved. So looking forward, we want to uh, improve our build caching. So right now, when you make changes to the build scripts uh, themselves, uh, then your build caching may be invalid because it doesn't know that the scripts themselves are uh, possibly a dependency. Um, we want to integrate with a project called RPM Distro Git Overlay, which allows you to do that local development style. So it'll allow you to build RPMs locally from source, uh, and it will give you a repo with that that you could then include in the build process. Um, 
we want to do a better job supporting other architectures. Uh, so we've got, had a couple bugs come in for both uh, ARM64 and 64-bit PowerPC Little Endian, uh, where our CoreOS assembler container didn't quite work as well. Uh, and we still need to get the uh, BIOS and UEFI working together. And that goes into the next point of removing Anaconda. So we don't need most of the functionality that Anaconda gives us. Like Anaconda is fantastic and does a million things, but we actually need to do like four things. So we need to uh, partition the disk, create file systems, uh, install the OS tree onto those file systems, and uh, inject it uh, air and uh, edit the uh, disk to uh, say what platform it's on. And Anaconda is overkill for this. Uh, and actually makes it harder in some cases because Anaconda doesn't know how to install like two bootloaders at once. Uh, and for doing BIOS and UEFI together, uh, you actually need to do that. And if you're doing it just normally uh, with Grub install, you can actually just run Grub install twice, one in EFI mode and one in, UE or, uh, and one in BIOS mode, and you'll get an image that works. So, yeah. Uh, I've included a couple links here. One is to the CoreOS assembler repo, so that's for the project I've been talking about. Uh, and then the other one is for the Fedora CoreOS tracker. And this is where we do most of our uh, development on Fedora CoreOS itself. This is where we do pretty much all of our planning and discussion. So if you want to get involved, I uh, highly recommend to check these out. Uh, any questions? Yes? You said you were getting rid of Kickstart. I got that from yeah. your what are you replacing Kickstart for the four things you need? Because somebody wants to bury those four things because people are people. So the, the, when, we, when we were talking about uh, image, the question. Oh, the question was uh, we want to replace Kickstart and Anaconda in our build process because there's about four things that we need to do uh, to build an image. Uh, those four things are just partitioning, uh, creating file systems, installing the OS tree, and uh, installing bootloaders. So. So you're gonna have a shorter kickstart thing for that, or is the, those things don't matter? You're not. There's nothing you need to tell. Like I'm building it for Amazon. I'm building it for that. That's not. You don't do that with kickstart. No. So we're we're not gonna be using kickstart at all. Yeah. Right. So uh, it's just gonna be. Uh, we have a bash script basically, and uh, the, actually the part where you tell it what platform you're running on happens later. If we actually take our generic image and uh, modify it using uh, guest fish. Uh, it's just a kernel, uh, kernel command line argument, so we just go in and edit the crub config. That's it. Other questions? Yes? Um, are there plans to integrate all this with Pungi? Are there plans to integrate all this with Pungi? Uh, I don't know of any at the moment, um, but I, I'm not opposed to it. Uh, because it's just in a container, uh, it's pretty easy to host anywhere you want. Uh, right now, we just have it running in Jenkins, but yeah, I'm, I'm not super familiar with Punji, so. Well, the reason Punji is the only one we post to Google or as a whole, so there's a lot of things that are integrated with the composers that get running Punji, Punji, because that's where composers for Fedora get running Punji. So if you're running composers for a Fedora thing. And on the side in a Jenkins instance that other tools don't know about, there's a lot of stuff in Fedora that just doesn't know this is happening at all. <laughs> I did not know you guys were doing it. I haven't been Fedora QA. I did not know you guys were doing this until I came to this talk. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the source of the question. Right? Yeah. Any other questions? How, how big is that bash script? How big is that bash script? Uh, how bash those? Yeah, uh, it's not that large. I can actually, uh, well, yeah, I can pull, can't quite pull it up because my current one is horrifically broken because I've been working on trying to get the UEFI and BIOS together. Uh, but it's not long, it's like maybe two, 300 lines. Uh, and most of that's actually just argument handling, so. And it's all in there? Yeah. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have any immediate needs that you could do have users having help? Uh, do we have any immediate needs that like we need help with? Uh, so I've been working on trying to get BIOS and UEFI working together with Fedora CoreOS in general. Like we have a, a million things. Like if you just go to the tracker repo, uh, there's hundreds of things that need to get done for it. Uh, for CoreOS Assembler, we need to do a lot of like cleanup too because it's a project that's grown very organically. Uh, and uh, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, you're a very more familiar than me, the Gen 2. Um, what do you think is the main and uh, most important role for you uh, take in your kind of DC or anything to our friends? If you have to give us a minute. The question was uh, what are the things that we're missing from Gen 2 uh, by going with a Fedora based thing? I'd probably say the biggest one is uh, the use flags where we can separate out. Uh, dependencies really cleanly and s disable whole swaths of options on a global level, uh, especially for building something where we don't want to ship Python and uh, we want to build as small an image as possible. Other questions? Could these images be used as a Uh, the question was, could these images be used with a USB stick uh, to install on a laptop? Absolutely. Uh, I've actually, like, it's basically, the, the goal is to get to, like, where we are with container Linux, where if you can get it on a disk and tell a computer to boot from that disk, it will come up. Uh, yes? Sorry, yeah, another question. So, um, to what extent is all of this stuff considered to be in production? And where are these images going? How are they getting distributed to people to actually use them? The question was, uh, to what extent is this uh, in production and where are images being built uh, so that people can use them? Uh, the first part is uh, they are absolutely not production ready at all yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the second question, uh, there's a CI pipeline. I don't remember where exactly it is. Uh, but the actually the slide deck from the uh, previous talk has that. Yeah. And if you want to try it out, I highly encourage you actually just go to the CoreOS assembly repo and build it. It doesn't take that long because it's just doing a compose uh, and like running Anaconda right now. You can build an image in like 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Yes? Is it all the images that you are going to ship or are the OS tree? Uh, we're going to be shipping, the question was, are we going to be shipping images or just the OS tree? Uh, <coughs> and both, because we, we'll, we'll need the OS tree for updates, but we are also shipping images uh, with every release, uh, just like we do with Container Linux. Other questions? Yeah. My question is this looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> question was, are the Fedora Core OS releases going to be tied with the Fedora releases? The answer to that is kind of. Uh, so we're, we're going to have uh, three different streams of updates, uh, and uh, they will be based on you know, various Fedora releases, uh, but they will not include like the version number in the release streams. Uh, and so if you're on a release channel, at some point you will just flip from like Fedora 29 to Fedora 30. But we're going to have three release channels. Each one tracks farther ahead than the other one. Uh, and so the idea is if you're running Fedora CoreOS in production, you should be running a mix of all three channels. So if we're going to ship an update that's going to break you, 
You have a chance to see that update coming ahead of time, have it take down like a node rather than all of your nodes, and then you can submit a bug report and we can fix it before it actually comes and rolls out to the rest of your cluster. And the overall of strategy is going to look something like to be atomic. You're going to be putting out new builds on each of these streams quite frequently. Question was uh, the release cadence is going to be like that of Atomic, where we do releases every two weeks, and yes. 